Thank you so much for staying with us. Well, see, as of this morning, the first batch of 1,600 Nigerians evacuated from uh, Sudan are to arrive. They were supposed to arrive yesterday, but they have not arrived. As at this morning. Now, media reports says that there are thousands of people at the borders and as such, there will be delays in getting Nigerians into Egypt. It is also believed that Egypt wants the students profiled before coming in. In another development, NITCOM, that's the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, in a statement signed by Gabriel Udu said, more than 7,000 people, including Nigerians fleeing Sudan, have been denied access to Egypt since their arrival late Thursday evening. Uh, so many issues to raise on this matter with uh, our guests. Uh, Laddie Thompson is a security analyst. He joins us virtually along with Bayo Oluwake, who is Consulting Research Fellow, African Resource Development Center. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, let me begin with you, uh, 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 Pastor Thompson. Well, uh, you've been talking about this uh, hydra-headed security challenges for decades, and um, it, it's, uh, we're, we're here now. Um, uh, can we slow this uh, trend or stop it? My own challenge, a single challenge that I have uh, that I raised when we talked about this last week was that there is only one country between Nigeria and Sudan. Any other country, I mean, any other route will be much longer. How significant is that in the scheme of things for you? Well, uh, let me quickly say to you that we think there is a country between Nigeria and Sudan. Thank you very much, Ayo. But if you look at the developments of what's going on in the sub-region and what has been going on with this Hydra that we've been talking about, the Hydra of Terror, there really and truly is no border between Nigeria and Sudan. Now, let me quickly tell you something that we need to take note of and why Nigerians need to learn quickly from what is happening in the Sudan. Don't forget that in 1958, when we were talking about independence, the regional government of Northern Nigeria knew that the judicial system and the legal systems that they had in the Northern region would never, there was no way Southern Nigeria would have formed a nation with them. Uh. So a panel of eminent Jews was formed in 1958. And I want to tell you that the Chief Justice of Sudan Said Mohammed Aburat was one, one of the person who chaired that. There was a Mohammed Sharif, I think, from uh, who, who was the chairman of the Pakistan Law Commission, the famous Professor J. N. D. Anderson of the College of African and Oriental Studies, University of London, Shetim Makashon, the Wazili of Borno, Peter Achimu, and Madam Musa. I can tell you that uh, the chief of uh, Bida, they were the ones who came up with the penal code and the code of criminal procedure that Nigeria is using today, that was brought to the center when we agreed to start a nation together. So I'm not sure that Nigeria really understands that what we've seen play out in Sudan is playing out in Nigeria right now. And we need to learn lessons quickly. But, but Mr. Thompson, just quickly before I bring in Mr. Luwaki on this matter, I mean, there are those who would say, look, Nigeria, we have Nigerians uh, who have gone to help other countries with their own uh, stuff as well. We've heard of Nigerians heading, of course, all over, even in the West, we have Nigerians recruited into executive offices, employed by the, you know, citizens there into executive offices. We have Nigerians who have been uh, asked to come and help with certain judicial offices in many other parts of uh, the world, and so, so on and so forth. So how is that significant to what we're talking about here this morning? Look, the truth is this. Until you look at the history of Sudan, you won't understand the conflict that is going on there right now. And what you're going to find out is that the deterministic chaos that Sudan was engineered to be is the same deterministic chaos that Nigeria too was engineered to be. Let me take it from recent, look, all the dynamics we have, the divide and rule along the lines of religion, 
by you name it. Everything is present in Sudan. When it was a Mahdi state under Muhammad Ahmad in 1881, don't forget that the British colonized it around the 1890s and they only gave up independence around 1956. Now, the history of Sudan since then has been plagued with wars, predictable. Southern Sudan was Christian, Northern Sudan was Muslim. Don't forget the Darfur, the atrocities, and all that. Now, don't uh, let us let us come to the fact that the man who used to be called the president, uh, Omar Al Bashir of Sudan, the former soldier, military again, as usual, the same trend, the same patterns. When he was ousted by the people who are fighting now, he was one who appointed Al Bashir. It was Al Bashir who appointed um, Al whatever his name is, Al Brahan and appointed Hamdan Dagalu. In fact, he brought in Dagalu as vice president, and don't forget that Dagalu, what we are calling the RSF, this is the rapid, whatever they're calling, is actually the Janjavid. Huh. It's our militants who are trained to destroy. Okay. Now, when, when the Southern Sudan finally got its independence and, and was able to move away, and uh, uh, President Omar appointed this uh, present uh, president of uh, Sudan, Two months after, he staged the coup. And when he staged the coup, the man who was supposed to be counterbalancing was supposed to be this Dagan. So Dagano betrayed him. And what has happened right now is that things got to a head because immediately they first overthrew the, 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 the government, they put into place something called a Transitional Sovereignty Council. Mm. Well, in 2019, my, my which allowed is, uh, America to it, deal with them. Yeah, it's interesting uh, the, the trajectory this is going, literally opening the, the, should I call it a can of worms, that many people need to understand what, what the issues are. But let me quickly bring in uh, Mr. Luwake as well, so at least he can have a first say in all of this. Well, Mr. Luwake, uh, from your experience, I mean, history tells us that this um, conflict, as we know it today, predates even Nigeria's independence, as uh, uh, Pastor Thompson has also mentioned. Uh, many people may not really understand. They mostly, we are talking about this crisis in the, from the perspective of Nigerians trapped in Sudan at the moment. Is there more to it? Are there more implications or complications that we are not aware of? I ask this because Officials of the Nigerian government have said over and over again that they did not know this was going to happen, that it kind of caught everybody unawares. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, I, in another life, although I'm speaking in my personal capacity uh, on this program, but in another life, I had the privilege of serving in Sudan. I lived in Sudan uh, twice. Um, and, and walked across the whole country. But like I said, I'm speaking in my personal capacity on this program. Um, first of all, I think uh, if we conclude that we never expected what is happening in Sudan to happen, I think that would not be... A, 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 that, that statement should be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, and I say that with, the, with all sense of responsibility. Um, when uh, Field Marshal Omar al-Bashir was removed by revolution, by ordinary Sudanese, uh, what you had, the military had no choice than to, to do what they did. The revolution had already went across Sudan, united all the people of Sudan against uh, the regime of President Omar al-Bashir. Uh, and there were so many scenarios at that time. I'm talking of um, 2018, it peaked in 2019. Uh, so many scenarios by various organizations, uh, the United Nations, and everybody who was working in Sudan. And those scenarios were predicated on the fact that Sudan had so many militia. You have, if you look at the formal institutions, you have the Sudanese armed forces, you have the Sudanese police, you have the Central Reserve Police Force. You have the, uh, the militia of the National Congress Party, uh, which ran the country. That was President Bashir's party. You have um, the Popular Defense Forces, the PDF. And then you have the various groups that had been, uh, that had, for some reasons, gone to war against the state. 
In Darfur, you had the Justice and Equality Movement, and then you, you have the Sudan Liberation Movement, Al Al Wahid, and then in South Kordofan and in, um, in Blue Nile, you have the Sudan Liberation Movement, uh, you know, the military, the military wings of the Sudan Liberation Movement in both South Kordofan and the Blue Nile State. So Sudan already had so many formal military institutions, militia groups, and non-state actors that were engaged in one form of activity, either fighting against the state or defending the state. So anyone who was tracking the developments in the Sudan from 2018 would have been able to predict that something was going to be. Now, when you had the alliance between General Al-Bohan and Hameti, General Dagalu, um, there was a sigh of relief, okay, uh, that this doomsday scenario with all of these groups, well-armed, well-resourced, uh, you know, and by the way, you also have the National Intelligence and Security Service, which is the Nigerian equivalent, the DSS of Nigeria. But they also had troops, okay? And actually, on January 14, 2020, the NIWS was in a, in a firefight against the Sudanese armed forces, and Khartoum was shut down because the NISS was disbanded but was not disarmed, and some disagreement led to that. So I'm giving you this background to understand that it may not be entirely right for anyone to say that they never saw this coming. I think the rapprochement between General Bohan and uh, General Dagalu only simply postponed it, you know, for everyone to say, wow, it looks like we are lucky. This doomsday scenario will not happen. Because clearly the two foremost forces on the ground, of course, were the Sudanese armed forces, and the rapid support forces. So this could have been predicted. Mm. That's all I'm trying to say. But mm. pardon me for giving you that very long. Well, no, effort. even that even that is quite quite salient in the conversation, uh, Mr. Lowaki. But the concern that Nigerians have, for which reason, part of which reason I asked uh, Pastor Thompson that question, is the Nigerians almost caught in the crossfire. On the one hand, we're hearing that there are 7,000 Nigerians who are rushing to come home now. Some of them, as we also said in the intro, are being denied access into Egypt. On the other hand was that information put out by the uh, uh, chairman of NITCOM that where there are something in the region of 5 million Nigerians. Well, I, 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 I was wide-eyed when I heard that in the first place. So uh, exactly what do you, I mean, since you've lived in Nigeria, what are are the challenges that people need to understand that uh, since you lived in Sudan beg your pardon what are the challenges that you you think people needed to have been aware of since as you say this was going to happen well first of all um, I think maybe what um, the chair person and she's done a, a remarkable job by the way uh, of the end Nidcon was probably alluding to is the fact that we have what you call Sudanese of Nigerian descent there are about 7 million uh, Slow down, Sudanese slow down, Mr. Nigerian Loake, slow descent. down. My, my apologies. Yeah. Uh, please explain what that means, Sudanese of Nigerians' descent. Yes, you know, uh, in days gone by, we had Nigerians who went for holy pilgrimage uh, in Saudi Arabia by foot. Uh, usually a lot of them would go to, to, to Sudan, walk for some time in the Sudan, and cross the Red Sea to perform pilgrimage in, 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 in Saudi Arabia. And then they will come back again uh, to Sudan to prepare to return to Nigeria. But it was often said that the Sudanese would encourage them to remain. You know, this was, this was the, the story. Yeah? But in any case, over time, you had this group of Sudanese who trace their origins to Nigeria and who occupy significant positions in the military, in the civil service, in the police. A significant number of them hail from the state of Darfur. So, there are those who even predict that about one quarter of the Sudanese population today are actually Sudanese of Nigerian descent. So that could be the, uh, the you know, that this, this is roughly the, the origin of this Sudanese. Of, and they proudly identify themselves, by the way, as Sudanese of Nigerian descent. Okay, but that, how about the, the other number, the 7,000 that are trying to come, you know, back? Why are I we have, having those challenges? I um, have a pinch of salt with that figure. See, look, what normally happens... And I've seen this in many African countries where I've been. First of all, Nigerians don't like to register with the embassy. 
Uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. I know people have their impressions about what the Nigerian government has done or has not done. I'm just explaining the reality from my point of view, my interactions with Nigerians in some of the places where I have been. Oftentimes, our citizens do not like to register with the embassy. Um, and if you do not register with the embassy, if you have, unfortunately, you have a problem like this, how does the embassy even know how many people there are? Okay, so I think this is the first problem. Second problem is you have some Nigerians who travel with illegal documents. And when you travel with an illegal document, you are unlikely to want to go and register with the embassy. If you travel with an illegal document, you are unlikely to want to, you know, ask the embassy to help you if you have a problem. So, um, as I speak, if we replicate, if you look at Burkina Faso, Mali, Central African Republic, all the other places where we have problems, DRC, most likely you also find a sizable number of Nigerians in this country who are still not registered with the embassy. So one of the lessons from this crisis is that we need to register. Just let me finish. Okay. So, so, so you have also a large number of Nigerian students, you know, uh, in the Sudan. And most of these Nigerian students, some of them are sponsored by state governments. Some went there by themselves. Uh, you also have amongst them those who are not inclined to, you know, registering themselves. So to, to arrive at an exact figure as to the number of Nigerian students or Nigerians who are in the Sudan, I think will be difficult. But I, I assume that uh, the figure which has been given by NITCOM is a figure they've arrived at after careful extrapolation. Okay, my sincere apologies for taking you back, and, and I know that Pastor Thompson is also yearning to contribute to this, but uh, to, to that issue you raised when you said Nigerians don't like to register, whose fault? Because there are many people who have, and I'm pretty sure you are aware of this as well, complain that when they get to the embassies, they, they're not well received. In fact, in some media missions you know, of uh, uh, Nigeria in various parts of the world, people take pictures, take videos, and show how decrepit the places are. And so, and getting feedback, getting services from Nigerian missions is sometimes turbulent. In these days of technology, people are expected to make physical appearances in these places. So yes, you are correct. It's possible that as you, from your experience, Nigerians do not like to get these things done. But on the one hand, they have these hiccups and these bottlenecks that they have to contend with. On the other hand, they are, they are asked to come, you know, at maybe three months' time, four months' time, and the rest of them. But if you pay a little more money, those allegations are there that you get it expressed. So help us understand how we get around that. Well, yes, I mean, it's true. I mean, I've heard, I myself have heard, I've read, you know, complaints by fellow citizens, you know, of how our embassies in some countries treat them, you know. Um, uh, and I won't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to speak for the, for, for the Nigerian. I think that, in fact, there's another matter entirely as to who should be dealing with our foreign policy, who should be speaking, especially in this kind of scenario where we we'll find ourselves. But the only, the only thing I would like to say to the question is that, look, if you find yourself in a country that is in a precarious situation, as a foreigner, the minimum, the minimum you need to do is to at least make sure that your embassy in that place knows you are there. If you are in the United States or if you are in the United Kingdom, maybe you don't need to bother yourself. But if you find yourself in Central African Republic, you find yourself in Mali, you find yourself in Burkina Faso, you find yourself in Sudan, and you do not make yourself available to the embassy, to let the embassy know you are there. Because these countries are not in the normal state. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Mm. So the minimum you need to do is fulfill all righteousness, and at least make sure you are documented, okay? And you've played your own role. And then let's take on that embassy, if it doesn't do what it is supposed to do, when things go wrong. I think that is how I would respond to, to that question. Okay. Uh, uh, Pastor Thompson, the same thing. At the end of the day, it is the protection of Nigerians in Sudan uh, that we are talking about now, which is very, very paramount. And government officials are working around the clock. We are also playing our part here discussing this issue. So uh, how do you, what, what are the lapses you have seen that need to be covered and by who? Uh, he's talked about the fact that there are some students in, uh, in the four, in, uh, in Sudan who are there by themselves. Some are uh, sponsored 
sponsored by their state governments. In fact, we understand that some state governments are already going over to bring their own uh, children home by themselves. What, how, what do you make of this rescue and evacuation uh, process so far? Thank you, again, Lyle. And um, I think in this case, we need to put on our thinking cap in Nigeria. The commonality between the citizen of Nigeria and the citizen of North, Northern Sudan, that is now Sudan, there's something very common between both. The shambolic democracies that are in place have no value for the life of the citizen. Whatever you see going on in Nigeria here, is the same sentiment over there. Now, what complicates this further for us in Sudan is that there are two schools of thought planted in Sudan that are dominant, that will affect us in Nigeria if we don't look ahead clearly. The first school of thought is that the black skin is considered to be inferior. This is part of what led to the split of North and South Sudan. The uh, uh, Arab olive skin influence and the Arab supremacist bid that is a global concern has infiltrated Sudan. So first of all, they look down on us as blacks that we are inferior. Number two, the elephant in the room is that we, we don't want to accept that between the years 1991 and 1996, Osama bin Laden was in Sudan planting an idea the idea that has removed the borders, the idea that makes Nigeria the inheritance of people who have been trained over years and have been ideated based on an articulate plan that Nigeria is to become their own territory, as it's just a matter of time. Now, that idea has never been neutralized. And the point now is this, is that if you look at the progression in Nigeria and the shambolic form of democracy that we are running, you will find out that it's either we stand up to who we are, we are the giant of Africa, we are supposed to be the solution nation to Africa. If we stand up on time now, we can solve this problem. If we solve this problem, it starts by first of all giving value to the life of our own citizens here. But to do that, the greatest enemy of that is the political class. Because the political class has been very predatory, predictably, not their fault. A politician thinks about the next election, statesmen, we must think about the next generations. So we are here in a situation now where there's this mass of people who don't regard us as real human beings. They believe that between, between animals and man, there's something there, and that's who we really are. Secondly, they have a supremacist ideology which is masked in religion. Unfortunately, Ben Laden groomed Nigerians. It, like, it's open, it's, this is open knowledge. Who met with him? And what we see playing out in Nigeria till today is still the master plan that came out of Sudan. So, if anything, when I look at the number of views, look, those of us who are above 60 in Nigeria, I can tell you something. We form less than 7% of the total population of this country. So the point is, is this. Why will we not look to the future of our children by rising above the cowardice, the confusion, the chaos, and the corruption to do what has to be done to give value to the life of our children and to make sure that Nigeria remains one? And if we are going to do that, let me conclude by saying this. This may not be very, but I think when I see Sudan, I see our students, I see our people, it was the same thing in Ukraine, my heart bleeds. I feel like cry. Now, if we're ever going to stop this thing, we're going to have to sit down and accept something. As we are right now, we are a very corrupt nation. If we don't, look, the outgoing president came in to battle corruption, corruption flawed him, has defeated him, has humiliated him. Many of us who put our trust in Muhammad Buhari when he was coming, are weeping on the inside right now. They may be going through all their games as politicians, but people who think beyond politics and beyond the drama know the effect on the lives of, of citizens in this country will realize that not only is it that corruption has flawed this government, it has also created a way for the hydra, for the hybrid threats, it has created a way 
but they are symmetrical warfare. It has created a way for the penetration from within, the war of narratives to weaken Nigeria. And what we are about to do right now is even worsening the situation of the future of our children. Mm. Nigeria right now, based on the political class of Nigeria, we are about to enthrone, listen to me, the embodiment of corruption in Nigeria is the political class. Now, the embodiment of corruption in Nigeria is about to do something. A country that is already, in fact, immersed in corruption is about to now enthrone corruption officially. Once this happens, listen to me, I want to point out something to you. The former president, uh, Good Lord Jonathan, he released a book. How can we in Nigeria be comfortable with a future that talks of a presidency where a person who has been pointed out by a former president to be a promoter of this Boko Haram, whatever, is one heartbeat away from the presidency. And we are saying we are not going to go the way of Sudan. Please, a stitch in time, says nine. And this is where I'm going to be calling on all God-fearing clerics. I'm talking whether you are a Muslim or you are a Christian. If you are supposed to be a cleric right now, Nigerians are scared. Nigerians have been, I mean, they've been corrupted. But at least the institutions that represent God in the country to be able to stand when it comes to stand like this. But Sam, Sam Adams, one of the founding you know, contributor to America's foundation, said something. He said, in every, if ever a time should come in America when vain, aspiring, corrupt men shall possess the highest seats, listen to this, in the government of America, he said, our country will stand in need of its experienced patriots to prevent its win. Mm. That is where Nigeria is right now. Right, let, let we me, have time now. Yeah. Let, let, let me, yes, let, let me ask uh, Mr. Luwaki, uh, one of the issues that's uh, come to mind as uh, uh, Pastor Stompton was talking are two issues that I'd like you to speak to very quickly. Uh, one, he talked about young people and data says that there are more than 50, if not 60 percent of young people populating Africa than there are older people, as uh, he also alluded to. So on the one hand, I'd like you to speak to that because it would seem like it is one of the areas in which we are being blindsided by the issues arising in the Sudan. What other issues can you point to, uh, areas in which we are being blindsided by these issues and that if we do not pay attention, it could sweep us as a nation in Nigeria? The question sounds simple, Ayo, but it's also very difficult uh, in the sense that there are so many ways from which I want to look at it. Um, I think particularly it is worrisome, you know, as Pastor Thompson said. If you look at Nigeria, at the minimum, 70% of our population um, is below the age of 30. Uh, that is extremely terrifying. Now, if you look at, you, you, you spoke earlier on, you know, when you were asking a question, you said there's one country between Nigeria and Sudan. Yes, geographically, there's Chad between us and Sudan, but there's also Chad between us and Libya. Libya has already collapsed, and we have seen some of the impact of that on us, especially in the Northeast and in other, you know, other parts of Nigeria where we had uh, asymmetrical warfare, banditry, and so on. But then if Sudan collapses, you know, I, I, earlier on I spoke about the multiplicity of militia groups, some of which were not properly disbanded. Weapons were not properly retrieved. And if you look at the, the contiguity of Sudan to Chad, to Libya, if you look at what is already playing in Libya with General Khalifa Haftar in Benghazi, and his army, which is probably better equipped than the armies of many African countries. General Khalifa tried to overthrow the so-called UN-backed government in, in Tripoli twice. And we saw the spectacular display of weaponry on television that he lined up when he was trying to take Tripoli. Now, why am I saying this? These groups largely have young people fighting for them. The RSF... Uh, leader, General Dagalo, in 2018, publicly said that he had about 3,000 RSF fighting with General Khalifa. General Idris Deby of Chad, 
reportedly was killed by a group that temporarily disbanded from General Khalifa and made a charge and went back. All of these groups have young people. Huh. And from what we have seen with Boko Haram insurgency as well, most of those fighting are young people. That tells us something. If we do not do something about the future of the young people of Nigeria and of Africa, we are going to witness worse things, right? But now it is up to the power elite, the political elite, to read the signs and to be matured enough to take the right steps now to prevent that from happening. And I'll add, by way of conclusion, that yes, I agree with Pastor Thompson that the Federal Republic of Nigeria has not been playing its role. It is strange, and I say this again with all sense of responsibility, that our best foreign policy years were under the military. It is strange. There's a responsibility placed on this country by providence, by God, by whatever you want to call it, that we need to play a role. And it begins with our political elite realizing that and doing the right thing. But to that policy also, you spoke, you made a statement the other time, uh, who should be saying what, who should be addressing what, especially concerning this evacuation process. Because we're hearing from the Federal Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, we're hearing from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, we're hearing the voice of uh, the Chairman of NITCOM, we're hearing the voice of uh, the National Emergency Management Agency, and a number of others like that are playing one role or the other. Uh, do you have a? Do you think that's a good way to go, or we there? Are, there is a there is a need for some streamlining. No, I don't think it's a good way to go. Again, I'm saying this with all sense of responsibility. I don't want to be misunderstood because someone might think I am castigating. I'm not castigating anyone. In a crisis situation, there has to be a clear chain of command. There has to be a clear chain of command. Um, our foreign policy is managed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The, the Nigerian Diaspora Commission has been legally empowered to cater to the interest of Nigerians in diaspora, and it has been doing a good job. But in a crisis situation where relationship with states is very important, I think the lead agency should be the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The spokesperson in the whole of this matter should be the spokesperson of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I read in the papers one or two officials, not of the foreign ministry, saying certain things, especially about a particular Western country trying to evacuate its citizens and saying that country came under fire. You don't make a statement like that. That can rupture relations. This is why it's good to allow the diplomats to speak. Besides, the embassy in a country is the one that has, supposedly has a list of the citizens. It's the one relating with all the arms of that state, which is its host government. So that embassy is in a best position to articulate what is going on mm. and transmit that to the foreign ministry. Mm. The, the diaspora commission is doing well, but it should do its job without necessarily being so visible. You know, NEMA is also, also has a role. It doesn't really have to be visible. Let the students or the citizens who are trapped know who to contact, know the person who, you know, let them not have this feeling that, there are four or five people or four or five agencies. Who do we talk to? Who do we contact? Who is organizing evacuation? Who is doing what? We don't need that now. All of them have been working well, but coordination is important, and I think it should be led by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But then you also identified the responsibility for the uh, embassy, the Nigeria's embassy in Sudan. We, we, no one seems to be hearing the voice of that embassy in any way, manner, shape, or form, not even from the, the, the High Commissioner or Ambassador there. Because it's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who should speak for the embassy. The embassy reports to the ministry. And I'm wondering where the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in the role of all this. Mm. You know. All right. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Luwaki. But let me ask uh, uh, Pastor Thompson, as we close on this issue, what would you, what, uh, well, we've started this conversation, this program this morning, by talking about an agenda for the incoming administration. If you would label an agenda within the next 45 seconds, what are the bullet point things that need to be done urgently so things don't get any worse? You already began to talk about them anyway. Okay, um, let me say this. There's an African proverb that says that if somebody accuses you of being a dog, you should not respond by backing or biting the person. 
Nigeria has systemic problems. We are about to officially enthrone corruption in a nation that is already riddled with corruption. We can see the future clearly. Right now, I believe that the owners should be. Right now, we know the political class cannot do anything. The systemic problem has tackled them. I would rather call on the, those who keep the moral gates of the country to talk about introducing a more dynamic and tropicalized form of democracy as an emergency. Okay. All right. right now. Okay. More than anything else. Well. A number of uh, suggestions have been made uh, along that line. There are those who are asking for us to domesticate our democracy. What that means, I guess we'll wait to see. Thank you so much for your perspectives this morning. Ladi Thompson is a security analyst. Thank you so much for your time. As well as Bayo Oluwake, who is consulting research fellow at the African Resource Development Center. Thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. We're back after now to talk about an issue that's been a problem for us and in terms of building collapses how do we curtail that more on that when we return from this break